Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to the P Belmar Public Library Poetry Jam Cabaret. Tonight, myself and Art Veo here is back. We're going to be sharing with you some pretty good poems, and we also have uh, a good little uh, discussion on poetry as well in general we're going to have for you. Um, so, thank you for tuning in on our, on our Facebook stream. Make sure you like and so comment on the, on the video below. Tell us what you think about the poems we read, which ones did you like, which ones do you want to hear. Uh, or if you want to come and join us uh, at the next Poetry Jam, please do and uh, share some poetry with us. So, without further ado, let's get started. Um, the first poem I'm going to do is uh, a poem by Jane Mayhall in her book, uh, Sleeping Late on Judgment Day. Now, Jane is a lifelong uh, resident of New York City um, and who wrote most of these poems in an urgent outpouring of, uh, in the last few years of her life. Uh, from the decades outdated subway token in the bottom of her shoulder bag, which calls forth earlier days in New York City, to the violin her father practiced among the pantry jams bars in her Kentucky childhood, Mayhall plucked small treasures that bespeak her fierce <clears throat> devotion to life with its clutter of memories and imperfections. In her tightly knotted, beautifully turned short poems, she elogizes a world not quite gone and brings us into contact with some of her contemporaries. Chief among her cherished memories is her long <laughs> bohemian marriage, which she recalls in a series of ravishing love poems to her husband. In, late, in line saturated with feeling, she describes how she accommodates her grief at losing him, and, at throughout, and as throughout this volume, how we must continue to greet life in all its gorgeous strangeness. So, the one I chose here, I just lost this page here, where is it? Uh, is a poem called, excuse me, I just have it here a second ago. Uh, come on. Here we go. Vesper Hours by Jane Mayhall. End of long day suffering, from the tips of chewed fingernails to the top of her furrowed brow, beneath the scruffy clock dyed her hair bangs chocolate kisses. Eyes of a child batted against Mickey Mighty Mall, counters and aisles, so much material, curtains, sweatshirts, assassin dolls, as to make Zeus run screaming from that first birth into the chaos we all come from and are bound for she lifts a stubbed hand and yells, price check. From aisles of negation, the cash box, like a spiritual retriever in the assembly, she's a girl of 20, sacred as a cow, maybe mystic in how she stands at her post, waiting for the other clerk at the back of the store to bring the right tag from the housing department. Like prayer beads, inserts of credit cards into the machine. What's the percentage on the toaster? Twelve ninety nine, lips mumbling, inured to the wobbling low moan air conditioning, taking comfort where we can. Best for hours. Mm. Looks like it's a store, uh, a poem about her experience in a store. You know, yeah. You go in, you buy, buy something, and you need to get a price check. Vesper, isn't that the prayer at the closing of the day? Yeah, it's a, a closing day uh, prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it sounds like in here, it's uh, probably the end of her shift. She's tired, you know, it says, the end of a long day suffering from the tips of chewed fingernails. Um, she's a, a child, a young girl, cashier, end of her shift. And she's waiting for her, her, her usual prayer is probably a price check because they, do, <laughs> they probably don't do the pricing right. So and she's waiting for the other clerk to come back to the store and all that. So uh -huh. yeah, I think that's a, it's a poem about how the, uh, Her the end of a long day. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there in my retail days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was Vesper Hours by Jane Mayhall. Um, the other one I have is my usual, uh, 
thing I like to do with uh, reciting the words of a poem, uh, of, a, of a song, uh, and say it out as poetry, because a lot of times we get a different uh, uh, vibe or feel from it when by listening it by word. So I chose this for this week, The Sound of Silence, written by Paul Simon, and uh, it's a, Art Garfunkel once described this poem as a song about the inability for us to communicate, that we lose our ability to communicate because of all the, the, the back and forth. This, this was written in the 1960s during the height of the Vietnam War, and we had so many different things going on. JFK's assassination, the, the war, the, the um, you know, sexual revolution, civil rights, all that stuff. So there was a lot of upheaval. And the song stands as uh, a warning and an encouragement for us to start listening to each other. So here's the sound of silence. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. In restless dreams, I walked along the narrow streets of cobblestone. And neath the halo of a street lamp, I turned my collar against the cold and damp. When my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light that split the night and touched the sound of silence. And in the naked light, I saw 10,000 people, maybe more. People talking without speaking. People hearing without listening. People writing songs that voices never share, and no one dared disturb the sound of silence. Fool, said I, you do not know silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might reach you. But my words like silent raindrops fell and echoed in the wells of silence. And the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made and the sign flashed out its warning in the words that it was forming. And the sign said, The words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls and whispered in the sounds of silence. Paul Simon. Good job, Lewis. Boy, Thank that's you. a sure sounds different when I hear you say it like a poem than from listening to it as the music that I'm so familiar with. Thank you for doing that. Oh, no, my pleasure, because the this song, you know, it talks so much about how, uh, I guess the best way to put it is, the flash of the neon light, it's an artificial light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when, in this, back then, as of now, advertising, all this other stuff came in, uh, coming up, television uh, finally hit the mass, masses uh, in large enough numbers where people are gazing at this neon light of of advertising uh, and, and uh, um, uh, propaganda things like that and it replaces the warmth of a fire of a campfire or uh, of a, a fireplace right so here we are and everyone's talking loudly and they're paying attention to the to the to the to this uh, neon light and the words of the prophets is also talking about commercialism. How on the subway walls and tenement halls are all these advertisements, commercials, ads, uh, asking people to buy stuff they don't need. So it's this total talk about how we forget. And in all that cacophony, we lose our, we lose our ability to communicate. It's a deep song, and there's more to learn about if anyone wants to uh, uh, read about it online. So um, I'm going to... I have one more uh, poem to do, but I'm going to save that for later. So I'm going to have uh, Art come on up. You got a few for us? Yes, I do. Come on up. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Poetry Jam. Uh, I'm Art de Veilleux. And uh, I've talked about before, um, I've talked before about reading poems and coming across words that I was unfamiliar with 
and having to look up those words to try to find the meaning so that I can understand the poem properly. Um, but I've often thought about the actual meaning of the poem and try to determine what that's supposed to be. And sometimes it's very slippery and kind of I lose its grasp and that is sometimes distressing but I've read also uh, from Jane Hirschfield, uh, a great poet and a writer uh, about poetry, and she talks about the uncertainty of poetry and how that is an important aspect of, the, of poetry, and that the ambiguity that seems to exist in some poems is really the opportunity for the individual to make their own interpretation and to bring themselves into the poem. So when I read that, I'm less distressed and more open to trying to find that special meaning, <clears throat> excuse me, special meaning for me within the poem. So I just want to um, read a little bit from, from Jane Hirschfield's book, Ten Windows, how great poems transform the world about uncertainty. So she writes that chaos, um, Hesedad wrote, Hesedad apparently is a Greek poet, an ancient Greek poet, um, is the progenitor of all being and things, gods, animals, human, stars, waters, trees, wind, Existence, it seems, takes root in ground so unfathomable, it can only be given a name and left behind. In one place, the name is chaos. In another, the Big Bang. She mentions uh, a, a statement from the poet um, John Keats, John Keats, mm -hmm. um, that describes poetry as the relationship to the unknowable in a, in a letter that he wrote during the winter of 1817. And further notes that later William Epson uh, echoed some of Keats' insights when he named ambiguity as the central quality of poetic beauty. So keeping ambiguity and uncertainty in mind, I want to read um, some poems from this month's Poetry Magazine, which is available here at the library. I'm going to start with um, the poem and I have these marked out, I, I hope. Um, oh, yes. Uh, from uh, Deborah Kwan, that's K-U-A-N, um, who writes that she applied to be poet laureate of her town in Wallingford, Connecticut, in February of 2020, when she was seven months pregnant, a month before Trump declared COVID a national emergency, and for months she debated whether or not that this was a good idea. And in her poem, The Night After You Lose Your Job, she wants to celebrate in particular the working women who have stretched beyond their sanity this year, pushed out of the workforce, or were among the first to be laid off when the company's bottom lines were hard hit by the pandemic. She wants to recognize after the long nightmare, the value of caregiving in the economy and society. So here's the poem, The Night After You Lose Your Job by Deborah Kwan. You know sleep will dart beyond your grasp, its edges crude and merciless. 
You will clutch at straws, wandering the cold, peopled room of the internet, desperate for any fix. A vapor of faith, an amply paid gig perhaps, for simply having an earnest heart or keeping alive the children you successfully bore. Where, you'd like to know, on your resume, do you get to insert their names? Or the diaper rash you lovingly cured with coconut oil? Or the white lies you mustered when the older man in the cream-colored truck that glorious spring day who hung his head out the window and shouted, Coronavirus! While you were chalking unicorns and seahorses in the drive. Where do you get to say you clawed through their night terrors, held them through their sweaty grunting and withering, half certain a demon had possessed them, and still appeared lucid at a 9 a.m. meeting, washed, combed, and collared, speaking the language of offices. At last, what catches your eye is posted large font and purple. A, long, a local mother in search of baby clothes for another mother in need. Immediately, your body is charged, athletic with purpose, gathering diapers, clothes, sleep stacks, packing them tightly in bags. You tie the bags with a ribbon and set them on the porch for tomorrow. Then you stand at the door, chest still thumping wildly, as if you had just won the lottery. And so you did, didn't you? You arrived here at this night in one piece from a lifetime of luck and error with something necessary to give. Deborah Kwan. Now, the second poem I would like to read. If I may. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. I mean, what, I, what struck me about that poem was her description of the difficulty a lot of people who stay at home to care for kids, even like during the pandemic. That's true. How do you put that in a resume? How is that, how do you present that as, as, as a life skill that's pertinent to a business? It's not. It certainly has value though. Yes. To the individuals and to society because we all need to be raised by someone. Mm -hmm. And that caring is very important, not just for children, but for elderly parents and for each other. So. I think that's the point she's trying to make. It's a statement that states how much our society has to change to now account for that value, to value that skill, that experience, uh, and not just uh, and and, uh, and not uh, uh, ignored or suppressed. It. Mm -hmm. Good poem. The next is a poem by Elizabeth Bradfield. Um, I can tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. One of the nice things about the magazine is it has a little paragraph about each of the contributors. Elizabeth Bradfield's most recent books are Theorem, a collaboration with artist Antonio Contro, and Towards Antarctica. Her honors include the um, Audrey Bor uh, Lord Prize and the the Stegner Fellowship, uh, founder of Broadside Press, Bradford works as a naturalist and guide and teaches creative writing at Brandeis University. So here's a poem by Elizabeth Bradfield. It's called Plastics, A Personal History. <clears throat> How can I find a way to praise it? Do the early inventors and embracers churn with regret? I don't think my parents, born in the swing upward towards ubiquity, chew and chew and chew on plastic. But of course they do. Bits in water, food, flesh, air, and their parents. I remember dad mocking his mother's drawer of saved rubber bands and his father-in-law's red, corroded jerry can, patched and patched, never replaced for new, for never rusting. Cash or plastic? Plastic. Even for gum, we hate the $5 minimum. Bills, paperless, automatic, almost unreal. My toys were plastic, castle, and circus train, and yo-yo. 
Did my lunches ever get wrapped in wax paper? Or was it all saran, saran, saran? Sarah's mom was given in Girl Scouts a blue sheet of plastic to cut, sew, and trim with white piping into pouches for camping. Sarah has it still, brittle but useful, merit badge for waterproofing, for everlasting. You too have heard stories, now quaint as carriages of first plastics, pre-plastics, ears of glass, wax cloth, and tin of shared syringes. All our grocery bags growing up were paper, bottom hefted on forearm, top crunched into grab. We used them to line the kitchen garbage pail. Not that long ago, maybe a decade, I made purses for my sister out of putty-colored, red-lettered plastic Safeway bags. I'd snag a stack each time I went, then fold and sew, quilt with bright thread, line with thrift store blouses. They were sturdy and beautiful, rainproof and light, clever, so clever, I regret them. And the plastic toothpicks, folders, shoes that seem so cheap, so easy, so use again, and thus less wasteful then. What did we do before to-go lids? Things must have just spilled and spilled. Do you know what I mean? I mean, what pearl forms around a grain of plastic in an oyster? Is it as beautiful? Would you wear it? Would you buy it for your daughter? So in turn, she could pass it down and pass it down and pass it down. Wow. So good, that, good poem, right? Oh, yeah. It, it, it really highlights how heavily into our lives plastic is. Yes. You know? It is very heavily into our lives. It's an amazing product, plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, made from um, um, oil. Oil. Yeah, mm -hmm. made from oil. It's a hydrocarbon product. Uh, and I, you, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, so one of the things, when I read the poem, and I've read it now a number of times, is I find little bits of meaning that I didn't get the first time I've read it. And I think that's where my opening comment about the ambiguity and uncertainty of some of the thoughts presented in poems can be seen. So I was happy to, to read it yet again. And I have one more poem. If, oh, yeah, absolutely. But I, I do have a, a comment to say. Like, sure. I can see where the ambiguity and the un in uncertainty comes in because she refers to that early in the poem. Mm -hmm. She asks, you know, did the creators of this plastic thing ever realize or think what would become of plastics today? I mean, back then, when it was all of a sudden, it was a miracle thing. Oh, yes. They had no idea of the problems that we would face today. No, not at you all. Know? And there's that uncertainty that was unseen. They didn't. They were uncertain, but they didn't even see that uncertainty because they were all blinded, I guess, by the potentiality of, of plastics and all. What did they say in the movie The Graduate? What was that? Plastic. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the last poem I'm going to read for today is also a poem that I read um, on the last Poetry Jam um, by the Poet Laureate of the State of Alabama, Jennifer Horn. And um, this poem also has a bit of ambiguity and uncertainty in it, so I invite you to interject your own meaning and yourself into uh, this poem called Out Walking. Out Walking. We don't know how to behave, as in adolescence, we stand uneasily at awkward distances from one another. As in adolescence, we stand uneasily in this new space, revising all that we have been taught. In this new space, revising the meaning of breath, hand, touch, near, 
our bodies become foreign to us. The meaning of breath, hand, touch, of near misses and close calls becomes obsessive. Even the air between us is charged now. Misses and close calls become obsessive. Better to stay in the one safe place, alone but uninfected, the new monasticism. Better to stay in the one safe place than become a number. The days stop counting themselves, simply march on. Become number, the days are the same and utterly different. Only a fool would complain about being alive. The same and utterly different. We don't know how to behave. As in adolescence, we stand uneasily at awkward distance from one another. That originally appeared in the periodical Deep South. Hmm. So, come and take this magazine out and enjoy some of the other poems that are in there. Get to know some of today's poets, and it'll be available here at the library. I'll now turn it back over to Lewis. Lewis, come and read us one more poem. I think you have. And, uh, all right. Um, Anxious to hear. Okay. All right. So I have here a um, a fun little tale uh, by Robert Service. Uh, Robert Service was born in England and lived in Canada much his life, but his poems often relating colorful adventures set in mining camps and saloons in the Yukon seem as American in spirit as the novels of Jack London. Now, for most of the 20th century, he has been one of America's most widely read poets. Dan McGrew, the lady that's known as Lou, and the boys who were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon are part of our culture, and poems like The Spell of the Yukon, The Heart of the Sourdough, and While the Bannon Bakes uh, are longtime favorites of readers everywhere. So this collection of poems here uh, the, uh, Robert Service, The Shooting of Dan McGrew and Other Poems, is available here at the library in our collection, of our, in our classics collection. And I encourage you to come and check this one out too. We do have a lot of other poetry books, and our poetry collection is growing. So come on in and enjoy it. So let me tell you the tale of the Ballad of Blasphemous Bill by Robert Service. I took a contract to bury the body of blasphemous Bill Mackay. Whatever, wherever, or whatsoever the manner of his death he die, whether he die in the light of day or under the peak-faced moon, in cabin or dance hall, camp or dive, mucklucks or patent shoon, on velvet tundra or virgin peak, by glacier drift or draw, in musking hollow or canyon gloom, by avalanche, fang or claw, by battle, murder, or sudden wealth, by pestilence, hooch, or lead. I swore on the book I would follow and look till I found my tombless dead. Now for Bill was a dainty, uh, dainty kind of lass and his mind was mighty set on a dinky patch with flowers and grass in a civilized boneyard lot. And where he died and how he died, it didn't matter a damn so long as he had a grave with frills and a tombstone epigram. So I promised him, and he paid the price in good chichaco coin, which the same I blowed the night, that, that very night in the tenderloin. <laughs> then I painted a three-foot slab of pine. Here lies poor Bill Mackay. And I hung it up on my cabin wall, and I waited for Bill to die. Years passed away. And at last one day came a squaw with a story strange of a long deserted line of tracks way back of the Bighorn Range, of a little hut by the Great Divide and a white man stiff and still, lying there by his lonesome self. And I figured it must be Bill. <laughs> so I thought of the contract I made with him and I took down from the shelf the swell black box with the silver plate he picked out for himself. And I packed it full of grub and hooch, and I slung it on the sleigh. Then I harnessed up my team of dogs and was off at dawn that day. 
You know what it's like in the Yukon wild when it's 69 below, when the ice worms wriggle their purple heads to the crust of the pale blue snow, when the pine trees crack like little guns in the silence of the wood, and the icicles hang down like tusks under the parka hood. When the stovepipe smoke breaks sudden off and the sky is weirdly lit, and the careless feel of a bit of steel burns like a red hot spit. When the mercury is a frozen ball and the frost fiend stalks to kill. Well, it was just like that that day when I set out to look for Bill. Mm -hmm. Oh, the awful hush that sang to crush me down on every hand as I blundered blind for the trail to find through that blank and bitter land. Half dazed, half crazed in the winter wild with his grim heartbreaking woes and a ruthless strife for a grip on life that only the sourdough knows. North by the compass, north I pressed, river and peak and plain. Past like a dream I slept to lose and I waked to dream again. River and plain and mighty peak, and who could stand unawed as their summer displays? He could stand undazed at the foot of the throne of God. North, I north, through a land accursed, shunned by the scouring brutes. And all I heard was my own harsh word and the whine of the Malamutes. Till at last I came upon a cabin squat built in the side of the hill. And I burst in the door, and there on the floor, frozen to death, lay Bill. White, I mean ice, white ice, like a winding sheet, sheathing each smoke-grimed wall. Ice on the stovepipe, ice on the bed, ice gleaming over all. Ice, sparkling ice on the dead man's chest, glittering ice in his hair. Ice on his fingers, ice in his heart, ice in his glassy stare. Hard as a log and trussed like a frog, with his arms and legs outspread. I gazed at the coffin that I bought for him, and I gazed at the gruesome dead. And at last I spoke, you know, Bill liked his joke, but still, <laughs> God damn his eyes. A man ought to consider his mates in the way he goes and dies. <laughs> Have you ever stood in an Arctic hut in the shadow of the pole with a little coffin six by three and a grief you can't control? Have you ever sat by a frozen corpse that looks at you with a grin? <laughs> and that seems to say you may try all day, but you'll never jam me in. I'm not a man of a quitting kind, but I never felt so blue as I sat there gazing at that stiff and studying what I do. Then I rose and I kicked off the husky dogs that were nosing round about, and I lit a roaring fire in the stove, and I started to thaw Bill out. Well, I thawed and thawed for 13 days, but it didn't seem no good. His arms and legs stuck out like pegs, as if they were made of wood. Till at last I said, it ain't no use. He's froze too hard to thaw. He's obstinate and he won't lie straight. So I guess I got to saw. So I sawed off poor Bill's arms and legs and I laid him snug and straight in the little coffin he picked himself with a dinky silver plate. And I came nigh near to shedding a tear as I nailed him safely down. Then I stowed him away in my Yukon sleigh and I started back to town. So I buried him as the contract was in a narrow grave and deep. And there he's waiting with a great cleanup with the judgment sluice head sweep. And I smoke my pipe and I meditate in the light of the midnight sun. And sometimes I wonder if they was the awful things I've done. And as I sit and the parson talks, expounding of the law, I often think of poor old Bill and how hard he was to saw. <laughs> Robert Service. <laughs> the, blas the Ballad of Blasphemous Bill. Not every poem has ambiguity, does it? No. It's no. clear what's going Very on. Very clear there. exactly what's happening right <laughs> there. You know? That's a great poem. It is. Now, this was written by the same guy who wrote what you did, uh, I think, on the very first uh, um, uh, poetry jam, which is the uh, cremation of Sam McGee. And there's a certain similarity oh, yes. in the story time and the story themes.
in a rhythm, in a rhyming scheme. Yes, and and I have to say, I really admire the use of language here. But that's it. That's what we have um, uh, for that uh, for tonight's poetry jam. I hope you like the poems. If you like the poems, make a comment down below. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you think. And if you want to come down and join us, the next poetry jam is going to be in two weeks, which is Wednesday, uh, um, September fifteenth. So uh, join us then if you can. Until then, thank you for watching, and see you next time. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo.